Hey guys, uh, welcome back to the Virtual Developers Conference. We are live. Uh, I'm Ish and my co-host is Girish. We have uh, Yusuf and Jules along with us. Girish, over to you now. Yeah, everyone who is not talking, they mute their mic. Okay, I have found that there's an echo right now. Okay, good. So we have with us two amazing developers, Yusuf and Jules. Yusuf who is a senior backend web developer at La Sentinelle, and Jules, who is now working at uh, Shopping Mind, who is also a senior web developer. So yeah, maybe Yusuf could uh, start by talking a bit about himself, and then we hand on to Jules, and then we start the presentation. It's all yours, guys. Okay. Hello, uh, I am Yusuf. Actually, I'm a backend developer at uh, Shopee Mind. I have been uh, working with Go for quite a while, and uh, together with uh, my friend Jules and other people, we have started the gofirst.mu user group, trying to promote uh, usage of uh, Golang in Mauritius. Um, that's about it for me. Hello, uh, Mike. Also known as Michael Goondo. Yeah, can you just wait? I'm here. Okay. Also known as Michael also, Go Online. And I'm a senior web developer at Bogasi. Uh, I've been working there for a few months now. It's been really great. As as Yusuf just said, uh, we started the Go user group in Mauritius. And our our main goal for today is to present Go to you and how it is easy to make uh, modern web applications in Go. And that'd be all for me. Okay, so first of all, um, as the title says here, it's Golang from zero to hero. Um, the objective of this presentation is to allow you to get a good, good grasp of Go and to understand what is Go and how you can use Go uh, to create uh, different services, especially HTTP services, uh, to aid you in your uh, development or at work or uh, on any project you might be on. So first of all, why Go? Um, people might be wondering, we already have a lot of uh, great programming languages out there, but why Golang? Why would you choose Golang? And there are some few reasons why Go is a great fit for your enterprise applications. Go is a compiled language, which means you have a compiler. Compiled language are known to have fast exec execution. And Go can also cross compile to different operating systems and architecture. This makes deployment a breeze with Go. With Go, you don't have any runtime dependencies, meaning you don't have shared libraries or things like uh, with other application you would have when you ship uh, your application. It compiled to a single binary. So every library that is required for your application to run will be uh, compiled uh, in a single binary for you to use. Also, Go is a strongly typed language. What we mean by strongly type is it's easier to detect errors ahead of time, especially errors that has to do with type errors. For instance, trying to assign an integer to a string variable. Go allows you to spot those kind of errors in advance and make uh, for a swift development experience and less errors at runtime. The third key aspect of Go is it has a lightweight syntax. There's a, there's a limited set of keywords and the language <clears throat> and the language has been, has been built to be easily read and easy to write. If you look at the Go spec document, you will see that it's very easy to go through it. It's only a few pages and this will let you grasp why we like Go, because of its minimal, minimalistic features. And Go is highly concurrent. Go allows for concurrency. We have channels in Go, 
and we have what we call go routines. Go routines are lightweight threads. And to communicate between those go routines or to synchronize those go routines, we use channels to communicate among them. And Go is easy to learn. If going back to the lightweight syntax, when you write Go code, when you read Go code, you will easily see how of a better developer experience it, it gives you in that regard. And Go has great enterprise support. For many popular platforms, there, there are SDKs, there are libraries to perform different tasks in Go. And this makes Go running in the cloud a great experience. If we go to the next slide, you will see that you will see a simple hello world example in Go. Go code is organized in packages. Here we have the main package. To import those packages or libraries, as some fellow developers will call it, you use the import syntax. So import and you specify the name of the library or the package or the path to that library or package. Every executable needs an entry point. In our case, this entry point is denoted by the function main. So as you can see, we have a func main. And in the body of that function, we have a single line of code. To explain the single line of code is from the font package, as we like to call it, the FMT package, we are importing a function that prints with a new line. And that function takes a single argument here, which is a string, hello world. So this is your simple hello world example in Go. Now going on to more syntax explanation in Go. As you can see, if we go to the left-hand side screenshot, we still have our main package. But now we are importing more libraries. And since we are importing a lot more libraries, we can do what is called a grouped import. So we just have to specify the import syntax. And we have the brackets. And inside of those brackets, we have uh, the various uh, libraries that you will need to import. On the few next line, you will see how we declare constants in Go. Here we are declaring a card threshold constant with a float number of 100.00. When decorating like this, Go already knows that this is a float number and will make card threshold a float 64, depending on your, on your architecture. Same as before, we have our entry point, which is function main. And in function main, we have some few computations that we are doing. First of all, we're declaring a coins variable and we are assigning it an array of float 64 values. In this array, you'll see that we have already defined some of the values in here. 10, 5, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.10, and 0 0.01. Actually, this is slightly a lie because this syntax that you're seeing right here is not actually for declaring arrays, but most likely to declare slices. Slices can hold a variable or a flexible amount of um, values in them. After which we are declaring an array this time with a fixed number of element, integer element of seven. And we also have a short syntax for declaring variables where you don't have to specify the var keyword in front, in front of the identifier. This can be seen with the amount. Uh, when we are assigning the amount variable, you will see that we have a colon equal to a 107.50. This is an assignment with type inference. In our case, it will be a float 64. We also have the ability to group variable declaration together.
as we have seen with messages and gets coupon. Messengers being messages being a slice of string and gets coupon deriving its value from uh, an equality operation, checking if amount is greater than God threshold. On the top right screenshot, we see an example of a loop. In our case, this will be a for loop. And on the same line as we have the fourth syntax or keyword, we are assigning i to a value of zero. Few characters later, after the semicolon, we are checking if amount is greater than zero. This is our condition while looping. And we have our incrementer after the semicolon, which is i plus plus, which simply signify that we are incrementing the value of i with each iteration. As you can see in the comment, it's a loop with an initialization, a condition, and an operation, as you would find in other languages. And the two few, the two lines afterward are just dealing with conversion. We can see how conversion is happens in Go. And then at the end, we are appending those, um, we are doing a font string f, which is just string form formatting. And we are appending the result of the font string f to our messages, to our slice of messages. And in the last screenshot, the one just below it, we see an example of a switch statement. In this case, we are switching or we are checking for the weekday. We are doing a time dot now to know um, what is the date today. And we are specifically uh, requesting for the weekday. And we have different case. We have a case for if it is Saturday and Sunday. If it is both Saturday and Sunday, which is we have grouped those cases together. It displays a nice, it appends a nice message saying, hope you're having a nice weekday. And we do the same for Friday and Monday. You will, but you will see for Monday, we have an explicit fall through. In Go, the break is implicit, so it doesn't fall through. But for Monday, we are explicitly fall through. What fall through means is we are falling through to the next case. For, the, for Monday, we are falling through to the default case, which happens here is for Monday, we are saying, say, we have, uh, we have coffee in the lounge and we are falling through right afterward to the default case where we are appending the message, say, have a good day. And at the end, we are printing all those messages uh, separated by a new line break. In Go, we have first class functions. What does that mean? Very quickly is functions are, can be considered as values. We can assign them to variables. In our first example, in the top left example of get doubler, you can see that we are returning a function here. And that function can then be used everywhere we need it. For instance, if we look at the bottom left example, we are using that same function, get doubler, or just uh, to, clar to clarify on some stuff, if you look at the get doubler function again on the top left, you'll see that it actually even accepts a function and returns a function, which is something uh, very impressive. And for even doubler, for even doubler, uh, top uh, bottom left corner, we are passing in an anonymous function, which means a function which doesn't have an identifier as our mapper. And we are then returning another function. This same example can be seen on the right hand side of your screen. In Go, we can also have var variadic functions. 
what we mean by variadic function is we can have a list of similar type arguments or parameters to a function. Func sum average, as you can see, accepts a list of numbers. In our case here, that would be a slice of numbers of type integer and returns two values of type int. There's no need to go through the body of the function, but what is really cool about it is this is done through the spread operator and we can have many return values as we've seen. The spread of operators is denoted by the three uh, dots before the type. And in the next screenshot, the bottom one, we have a numbers variable using the short assignment, which accepts a slice of integer, one, two, and three. And then we print the sum average of those numbers still by passing it in the function above using the spread operator. In Go, we have, uh, we can say that Go is somehow object oriented. This is a very debated topic. If we look at the first screenshot, uh, on the top left corner, you would see that we create a new type, a type person of type struct. This type person can hold different uh, properties, as we would call it. Those properties are name and we are glasses. Name is a string and we are glasses is a Boolean value, true or false. And how can we do object oriented in Go? We just assign a function or a method to that uh, person struck. And that method here is a string method we are applying. So we have func p person p denoting the instance of person, the instance object of person and string just being the function uh, that we will create in that instance or method will create and it will return a string. And this you can see in the body of the function where we're just doing some string formatting with my name is and, use, and using the property of person, GSP. In the bottom left corner, you will see uh, two more examples of um, object oriented in Go. We have two struct, we have the animal struct and we have the employee struct. Same as for a person, we are attaching two methods to them or two functions to them, which is a string function. And that string function return a string for each one of them. And the body is the same. We're doing some string form, form, uh, formatting. So you can see that for animal and you can see that for employee in the body of uh, various methods. In the bottom right hand side, we have this, we show how we can create objects from the structs that we did before. We Here we are creating a John object and for that John object, we are assigning the name property to be John and then we are putting it with a new line. Just below that screenshot, we will see a more advanced example of how we can assign various uh, the various properties of employee. So we declare an employee object, EMP in our case, and we are doing various assignment. So EMP.WearGlosses is just syntactic sugar for what we see below. Because EMP, because when we are creating the employee struct, if you look back to when we are declaring the employee struct, you will see that we are actually embedding the person struct into it. When embedding the person struct into it, we are also embedding the properties that the person struct has, which is name and we are glasses. And going back to the bottom right um, screenshot, the function main, 
you will see that we are using a syntactic sugar which is equivalent to doing emp.person.wearglasses. In our case, we are doing emp.wearglasses is equal to false because those two are the same. And the other two assignment are just basic assignment, which is emp.name and emp.department. This also is same to emp.person.name and emp emp.person.name and emp.animal.name where we are assigning John, John Doe and Tiger. And at the end, we are printing this employee object with all the properties in it. And when we are printing the employee object, this function println from the form package knows that it should call to the string methods in our case here. Here we have an example of struct attributes. We have a cat struct and it contains a property file type string. This file's property has a struct or a struct field attribute, which is denoted by the back ticks, JSON colon file. What this means is whenever we are doing JSON unmarshalling or marshalling, in the JSON object, it will look for that file key and associate it to the property file in the cat struct. Just below that cat struct, we can see an example of how channels are used in Go. We have a get cat function, which loads a cat. In the parameter of this function, we have a tube para parameter, which is just a read only channel of type string. In the body of get cat, we are doing a simple HTTP request to aws.random.cat slash meow. We are then reading the body of that request in a rents in a response um, variable and after which we are using that response variable to unmarshal the value in our cat object which has been declared earlier and then we are passing the property file of the cat object into the tube uh, channel, which we received as a parameter in the function. On the right hand side of your screen, we then have our entry point func main, in which we have a group uh, declarations of some variable cats, and you would see a new uh, library being used here, which is sync. The sync library exposes some methods which are helpful when working with channels and with coroutines. On the next line, we have a for loop that creates four, that creates four go, go routine of get cat, which is denoted by the go keyword. Using the go keyword and then name of the function of the word get cat with its, param with its parameter tube, we are firing four go routines. But we are also we but we also need to wait for it to complete. So we create a wait group and that wait group we add one every time we are firing those go routine so we are able to track them. Afterward we are creating a single thread or a single go routine to read all the values from from the tube or from the channel tube that we created earlier. We can loop over that channel using the range keyword in a for loop, and we append the values that we received uh, through that uh, tube channel 
into the cuts uh, slice of string. And then each time we do that, we know that we have done with that uh, group or that uh, go routine. We say we call the done method from weight group, which subtracts one from the weight group. And at the end, we wait for all the threads to complete using wg.wait, the wait method. And one thing that is very important is we need to close our channel tube. And after which, we print all the cuts we received in the slice of string. Thank you. That will be all from me. Um, so, as you can see, Jules has uh, shown the syntax itself is very simple. You can read it without much prior knowledge of the language. And now I will try to um, show more of the language and the code, how we can use it for HTTP um, services. Okay, uh, with some examples. Here is a quick and uh, description of the basics uh, that we expect from a microservice. Usually, we again start with Frank main. We expect a, we are creating a route slash hello, and uh, we are just going to say hello world to it. The code itself is quite verbose in and of its own. So, there's no, no much uh, to explain here. And uh, below, we are also creating other kind of handlers. I don't need to declare an anonymous function. I can use uh, already existing uh, functions that have been implemented elsewhere, or even uh, loaded from a library. So Go can do hello world easily. You can also have get request. In this uh, particular example, we will try to receive all values passed as query string, and we will send it back as a JSON using a JSON encoder. Uh, these are features that uh, exist uh, already in the language. Okay, so back to our main. We also have a post handler. We will try to see how we can read um, contents of a post request, the body. We will try to unmarshal it using JSON. And uh, Go also has a built-in templating engine. Uh, we will try to see that with the template handler. So onwards to the post handler. Essentially, we will try to start this. Let's see that zero. Okay. So to Actually, let's do a uh, go build. I will show you how you can compile your code. For example, you have this one, the basics. I can just put all my code here in the same directory. I'm not using uh, particularly complicated packages um, because this is a very simple, straightforward example. To begin with, let's. So once we are in the directory, we will try to do a go build. Let's see what it has produced. It has produced this executable um, program that we can run like this. So it is running. Uh, I have not put any output, so it will just say, uh, it will just wait here until you can execute it. Let's try our different routes. So for the, for the first example, we are going to send our request. So Dave, well, we are going to do a send a request. You can see all the values that have been sent in the HTTP request are sent back, and it's uh, quite fast too. Uh, it, it took like seven uh, milliseconds. So let's go to And then once it, uh, so it's fairly simple. Now for the post request, 
it is outputting hello DevCon 2020, but what is actually in it? First, uh, we want to define what kind of message we want to be receiving. We are expecting a message to contain a field name. Okay, so again, I read everything I have from my body. It's fairly easy. Go and for uh, tells you to do explicit error handling. Don't just let go and let errors go by. So you can get an error from reading the body. Maybe the encoding is not correct. Maybe it is missing. Maybe there's a network error of some sort. You want to handle the error directly here. And probably on a production environment, you will output, uh, you will use a proper logging function at this particular point. An error here is not the same as an error below. So you handle it where it happens. In other languages, you might have a big try and everything goes in uh, the body and you have a single catch. So when an error occurs, you don't know exactly where it is. Um, of course, you can use different try catchers, but Go recommends that you handle the error as soon as you can. So I'm unmarshalling. Unmarshalling is very straightforward in Go. And I am going to output a header status, OK? Uh, of course, Go does it for you. Uh, this happens by default if you do not specify it, but uh, we want to be explicit here. And we can write just a stream of bytes, um, just like we have received. And now um, for templating, let's uh, open this link in the browser. Let's see what happens. So you have this nice HTML that has been uh, rendered for us. Okay. How do we go about doing this? In the template that go, uh, this is the function. At the very beginning, I'm declaring my templates. Using must means if the template cannot be com um, compiled, the application will fail at the very start. It will not fail during, execu uh, during execution. It will fail during in initialization. And our template here is on disk. There are ways you can embed the template in your binary, but uh, we are keeping things simple here. Um, the templating language is very simple. I'm just dealing with planets. A planet has a name and a photo. Again, Go being a type language, um, wants you to be very explicit about what you are doing. I have a planet which is uh, a, a slice of planets. I have defined these values already. And then I'm just telling the template, OK, please execute the template on the output stream. The output stream itself is the HTTP response writer. And I'm going to pass you uh, the values planets. And here, as you can see, I am doing a loop on planets, outputting the name and the photo. Fairly simple. Uh, no need for external libraries here, and it just works like we just saw. That will be uh, for the basics. Go can do a simple HTTP, can do also templating. Now let's try to do something that we might encounter more. In, uh, using try, we are trying to make a REST endpoint. Our endpoint will be dealing with two resources, articles and authors. Uh, this part is called uh, a JSON tag. I am going to specify what uh, will be the name of the fields in the JSON response when I am will, when I will be encoding it as JSON, and this is for uh, generating fake data on this article. We will be seeding our data, our in-memory uh, articles using a fake uh, library. So in it, in it exec always executes before main. So I am just going to be seeding it with 10 articles. Okay. And uh, for our 
rather than defining separate handlers, I have defined a service. Listen and serve here, as you can see, it will accept a handler. Okay, what kind of handler? A handler is anything that has a serve HTTP function with this particular signature. So as with any uh, REST uh, system, we will be switching on the method. Based on the method, we will be calling a different uh, handler. The handlers themselves have been defined in the service as methods of the service. So um, even if you do not learn, uh, you do not know Go, you can see that we are getting a request and we want to see based on the method of the request what we will be doing. So if the method is get, that's very verbose, post, put, delete, and if it is anything else that we do not want to handle, we just uh, return with a uh, status method not allowed, which is uh, how we, uh, we do it in the REST paradigm. But if it is a get, uh, we want to see if it ends with an ID. If it ends with an ID, then it will be a get. If it does not, then it will be a list. The implementation is fairly simple itself. Uh, rather than outputting it directly here, we have used a response object, which will be doing uh, the work for us. Response, when we do send, it will already say application design. We will be encoding it directly to the output stream. If we normally the status will be okay. And we will be writing our status here. If no data passed, we send an empty JSON. And else we will be actually encoding the data. Okay. So back uh, to our service. By doing a list, we are just sending data the slice directly. It will do the encoding for us. If we are trying to do a get, we loop in the articles. Normally, that would be a, a database query. Um, Go has ample support for all SQL databases and also uh, cloud services and also uh, even Mongo databases and, and other new SQL databases. But here, for simplicity, we are using in, in the memory slice. We're able to loop in it. And if we are not able to find it, we will just say status not fine. And Go also allows us um, for, the, for the put. We will be adding the article here in our slice by unmarshalling, and then we just uh, put our article, we get the ID, and then we just send back the article that we have to replace it. Okay. And then uh, for creation also, it's not a big deal. Here we are actually uh, replacing uh, for the put, Okay, for the put, we are replacing. For the delete, we will be removing it. For, to remove, we use a simple uh, trick here. We are just sending the article to the end of the slice, and then we are trimming the slice by one. Create is similar to put, just that we are appending, so we don't have to look for the article. Now, how do we go about um, testing it? Let's go back to our terminal. So, go build. It is even for uh, compilation. It is rather fast. So that's an advantage when you are developing. So let's try to get our articles. Here it is. Some great random data for us. And all the data that has been generated, let's try to get this one. Okay. Work 
works as, ex as expected. Everything working just fine. And it is rather fast also. So we want to try to put a new thing here. Replace it. We're able to change what needs to be. And if you want to delete, that's okay as well. Okay. And even for the post, uh, let's try to create a, a new article. Okay, it has been able to actually create it. So it is very uh, easy to do a, a simple REST service which goes on to illustrate how good Go is for microservices. So the speed of it. And uh, for our final uh, demonstration, I will be showing how to, um, we will be using service, uh, a streaming request. How does it work? Let's see the demo first and then we will come back to the code. Again, go build. Okay. So it is listening on uh, ADAD. Let's go to our requests. So this is a simple service. It, we have the quotes handler. The quotes handler is actually looking for a message. And we have said that the message, we will be actually looking for two backend services. A backend service that will... A back, a back end service that will be looking for a name. Okay, it returns a surname and a name. Uh, it is making a request over HTTP. And uh, for the quote also, it is going to be making another request over HTTP. But the big advantage here is that we can do both these requests simultaneously. We are not going to be uh, waiting for the name first and then the content. We will be letting them work in parallel. And once we get both, we can actually return a message. Okay. So we are going to get our message. And once we get our message, we're going to encode it uh, using JSON. So we can see this works. Uh, here, there is an issue with our name uh, backend service. It is returning anonymous all the time, but the application is still running. We are not facing any downtime because we have been able to um, deal with the errors and all. And now about uh, how do we turn this into a stream? So what kind of stream are we talking about? Um, so let's see. Okay. That's it. So uh, we are going to be having this here. Let's try. Here, uh, the there is some concurrency that is at play, which is why I'm going to try to show you on two different browsers. We are fetching data on the internet, and we want to keep fetching data at an interval. How do we go around doing that? we have defined a very simple stream object. No external libraries used. We, on the stream, we have listeners. A listener will have an ID and will be able to accept messages over a channel. And we will be using a mutex just to protect uh, this uh, map to ensure that it works concurrently, read and write. So when whenever we are, we are going to start the stream, it will get a message, get a message initial
actually it was not concurrent. We have just made it concurrent by using the Go keyword here. We just broadcast everything and then we sleep for three seconds. How do we broadcast? Broadcasting is simple. We loop uh, once we get them, uh, we get some content. We loop over all listeners, and then we just put the message in the channel. And uh, whenever anyone wants to tune in our channel, we lock the mutex on the map. We add a new person, and then we return the ID. Okay. And again, similar for tuning out, we just delete the ID from the map. But the, the interesting thing here is um, the stream handler. The stream handler will work whenever a new person comes to the website, there will be the stream handler. The stream handler, we will try to uh, flush at interval different content. We're actually using an event stream, which is part of uh, the HTTP protocol. Uh, whenever you are uh, sending data, streaming data from the server, but the client does not need to uh, send data back, uh, this is a very good protocol to use. Uh, we you do not always need to use WebSocket for this kind of uh, purpose. So, first, we are going to tune in, and then I am using the defer keyword here, this will execute when it, just before the function exits. We want to ensure that we are not uh, broadcasting to people who have already left. So I am tuning out whenever this function exists for whatever reason. Okay, so I am going to take, as you can see, message here is of the type channel. It is a receiver channel. We will be receiving message from it, and once we get message, we just print it back to uh, the client. So what are we dealing with here? If you go on the network, let's reload the page. You can see it is fairly well synchronized. We're dealing with an event stream. Okay, um, Firefox is not showing it, but this is one of the nice things we can do with Go uh, to easily take a simple function and add concurrency to it. You get code here, for example, is a synchronous function. It gets data from an external service and then returns it. No concurrency. Get name also, same thing. It gets data from an external service and it returns a value. No concurrency. But when we do a get message, we add some concurrency to it here, and we deal with the concurrency. Same goes for string. Um, stream, it does not know that whether or not get message is concurrent or not. It does not need to know. But it is able to add a wrapper over it and uh, just get the message. Assume that the message will always uh, return because we are dealing with errors uh, externally. And then we are able to broadcast quite easily. Um, so that's one of the major advantages of uh, Golang, where you can easily consume uh, external data and uh, add concurrency to your application without overthinking it. So uh, that will be uh, all the time how for demos today. Um, so that's that's that is that's it for the demos. Um, before uh, finishing, I'll just give a list of uh, resources that will help you start with Go. Uh, we have the tor.golang.org, which is very easy. It can take uh, like 15 minutes for you to just uh, master the syntax of the language, try to do some things of it, and once you're able to do that, you have effective Go where you can write Go correctly. If you need a library for Go, you don't know where to find it, we have awesome Go. There's also Go by example. If you want to do a particular task, but uh, you're too lazy to uh, write the code yourself or you're not sure how to do it, and you have amazing uh, Golang books also. And there's a podcast called Go Time, um, where you can hear about people 
who are leading in the community. Of course, you have gophers.mu, which is our user group in Mauritius. You're welcome to uh, join us. So thank you very much for watching. And uh, please don't forget to give feedback. That was it, uh, Jules and I. Anything so thank you Jules? very much. We hope you enjoyed the, our presentation about Go. Okay, so yes, Yusuf and uh, Yusuf and we have uh, with us uh, Jules. We have some questions from the audience. Rengen asked the uh, two questions. So, can I can I start? Yes, please. Yes. So the first question is: Is slice similar to a list in concepts slash semantics? Well, it uh, it depends. A slice can accommodate uh, data of the same type. It uh, you can increase the size of the slice. You can reduce it. So in that case, yes, it is uh, it is uh, effectively a list. But uh, that's that's a to, to go in more the technicalities of the language. Um, which you don't need to must to know if you just uh, want to develop microservices. But if you want to go further, uh, a slice actually is uh, a pointer to a series of contiguous memory locations. Uh, so that uh, it actually points to where the data is actually stored. So in that sense, it is a list. But there are other kinds of lists uh, in Go which you can use for specific purposes. You have weak lists if you want to keep uh, weak references to your data, for example, uh, for caching purposes and all. You can also have, uh, like we can, you have seen maps. With a map, we are using mutex, but you have uh, specialized maps that uh, come with uh, built-in concurrency uh, handling. But for our simple purposes, it uh, it is not necessary to uh, worry too much about it in the beginning. Okay. So. Yeah. So we have a second question from Renge. Are the JSON tags type annotations? Uh, can you please read? I didn't catch it. Okay. Are the JSON tags type annotations? Um. They are annotations, but I'm not sure exactly what you mean by type annotations. It just provides uh, metadata. Uh, Golang has a built-in library. I'll try to go to um, one of the JSON tags uh, that we had. But yeah, we have JSON uh, tags here. Wait. The, these Wait. tags. Wait, uh, each needs to change the scene for you to show that. Wait. Just give me two seconds. That's happening, and it's live now. Yeah. Uh, as, as you can see, this is a struct. Go allows you to define metadata on a struct using just this. OK, anything you write here, you can retrieve it later. But uh, there is a library in Go which follows a convention. The convention is um, this will be a name. This will be a value. And between name value pairs, there will be a space. So you can effectively retrieve this metadata quite easily. If I am looking at this, the field ID, I want to retrieve the metadata for the value JSON. I will get the ID, uh, the ID value. But another library is using Faker, for example. This is a third-party library that I am using. The convention is that they wanted to use Faker with their own rules here. Um, but we use JSON. Uh, this is fairly common because JSON marshalling is built in the language. There's also XML marshalling where you can uh, define your uh, use the tags for XML. But there's nothing that prevents you if you want to do advanced Go to define your own tags uh, for your own metadata. Uh, so that's about it. It is metadata about the fields in a struct. Uh, 
Okay. Yes, uh, we are back uh, on the speakers and host uh, area. Uh, Yusuf and Jules, thank you very much for the presentation. And I think uh, uh, any further questions or comments from uh, people who are watching can continue on Facebook, can continue on Twitter. So I'm sure you guys will answer. So yes. once again, Jules, Yusuf, thank you very much.